Well, today we're going to read Jesus' message to the church at Thyatira. Now, in case you're kind of new to this, uh, there in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus spoke directly to John the apostle, and he recorded this, and he gave him messages to seven churches, and they were in in an area that we would call today, it's modern day Turkey. And uh, he started with uh, a church and went clockwise, seven churches. And these are seven messages, seven letters to very real churches. Now they apply to us today. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, the city of Thyatira uh, before uh, I get into reading what Jesus said to this church. Uh, They were a city that boasted about their trade guilds. Now, if you don't know what a trade guild is, uh, it's kind of like a modern day gathering, if you will. Uh, you know how some uh, companies will gather in Vegas, or they'll gather in Atlanta, or they'll gather somewhere like that, and they put on a big show, and it, they do it to sell products, they do it to create all kinds of interest from other people. And so, uh, or it would be a little bit like a, a, a plumber's union or an electrician's union. Now, the problem with these guilds, they, they, were, they were designed to create business, just like modern day things are today. And people that participated in these trade guilds were, they made connections for business. And people that refused to, uh, uh, to participate got shut out. They got shut out of a lot of opportunities and it will cost them often financially because they didn't participate. Now, here's the problem with what they did at these trade guilds. They were known for two things. Number one, they would worship a false god, which if you were a believer, you're like, no, we can't do that. There were some, and we'll, as we'll see, uh, in this church that said, you know what? I don't really believe this person is a god or this god is the real god. I'll just kind of go along. I'll go. I won't necessarily worship that deity, but I'm going to go so I can create business contacts. So that was the first problem. The second problem at these guilds was that they connected wild sexual orgies with the guild. It was kind of like that they were offering these things for their clients. People do this same type of thing today. I've heard, I've never participated in this, but I've heard of people that will take their business clients to strip clubs, okay? or things of that nature, because they believe that's the way to get them to buy their product or whatever. And so this was kind of like what they did in this day, except for um, that they would have temple, in these false temples, uh, false pagan temples, they would have temple prostitutes, and they would pair them up with the business people. And so you can see the real problem. Now, one of the boasts of this city was that they were the city where the Son of God lived. You see, they had a gigantic statue to Apollo, who was supposedly the son of Zeus. And so their claim was that we are the city where the Son of God lives. Now, if you've noticed the pattern as Jesus talks to each of these churches, He normally begins with some kind of statement that you don't know that it's really related, but he's making a claim. Uh, We've seen where he made the claim that he had the true sword um, and, and, and so forth. And the claim that they had was that they were the city where the son, the real son of God lived. So let's begin reading in uh, Revelation 2 verse 18. And to the angel of the church, we've learned that that word, uh, angelos, it means messenger, and he's talking about the pastor. So he's giving this message to the pastor of the church to preach about this, to teach about this, to remind people about this, and he's giving it to the church as well. So to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God. Do you see how Jesus just takes over? They said, well, we've got the place where the Son of God lives. He goes, no, here are the words from the real living Son of God. Not a statue, but the real God. And I'm so glad that he said that. He said, who has eyes like a flame of fire. That's metaphorical for that Jesus sees all. He's able to bring justice. 
that whatever is wrong, he will eventually make right. He had eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze. And it's describing his, not only his majestic, uh, his majesty, but his holiness and his right to be able to judge correctly and to correct things that are wrong. So uh, Jesus is establishing himself as this. And then he goes and he commends this church. Then he corrects them. He says, here's something you need to fix. And then he gives them this opportunity to agree with him. That's called repentance, to agree with God, to, uh, to change your mind, to change your thinking. And then he reminds them of the reward they're going to get for being faithful. He really follows this pattern in every one of the admonitions to the churches. So he says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance. And that your latter works exceed the first. And you know what he's saying? You're just getting better. You're getting better and better. What, what, a, what a compliment from Jesus himself. He compliments the believers in this church and the church itself. He says, you're getting better and better. You're trying hard. You're doing well. I'm proud of you. But then notice what he wanted to correct. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. Now I'm going to explain that in just a moment. That sounds kind of funny though, doesn't it? Uh, you got that Jezebel in your, in your house. And um, so he says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Remember, he's referring back to those trade guilds and the compromise that people were willing to make in order for financial gain. And we've got to learn that Jesus is greater than a trade guild. Jesus can make up any deficit you may have in your business, in your job, in your work that you perceive that maybe you won't get ahead if you don't do this and compromise your values. But you don't have to. He said, I gave, you time, gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation, and unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Now, I've got to tell you that Jesus is reminding them that there are consequences to their actions. And you know, the truth is, I believe God wants to bless you, I believe that God loves you. I believe that God wants to find something in you just like he did to every one of these churches to brag about, to say you're doing well. But he also wants us to, to recognize the sin in our life, to recognize the shortcomings in our life because every one of us has them. But he also is reminding us, you know what? I love you and God's grace is sufficient for every part of your life. But there are consequences to your actions, you know? I mean, look, if all I do is eat cheese fries and pizza and I eat 5,000 calories a day and sit on the couch and watch Netflix eight hours a day, you know what? Jesus still loves you and his grace is still in your life, but you're going to gain weight. Does that make sense? There are consequences to your actions. If you go in because you're having a bad day at your work and you go in and you curse out your boss and you flip off everybody in the business that works with you and you flip over the desk as you walk out, the consequences are probably going to be that you lose your job. Now, God still loves you. God wants to supply for you. But do you understand what he's saying here? That there are consequences to our actions. And I think this is a very important thing to learn, especially in our culture. Because in our culture, the idea is promoted that there really are no consequences to our actions. It's what I call, and once again, this is my opinion, okay? It's what I call the participation trophy mentality. You cannot live life where you constantly have no consequences to your actions and then think that things are going to get better. Okay, that's what Jesus is saying. He's reminding them of this. He says, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, 
you who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. By the way, in our culture, there are people that say that this is the key. These are the secrets to be able to get to the top and whatever it is. And don't believe it. Don't believe the lies. Believe the word of God and what God says about how we should live. He says, to you, I say, I do not lay any other burden on you, lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. Remember that phrase, that sentence. Hold fast what you have until to him. And the one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces even as I myself have received authority from my Father. I'll explain what that means in a moment. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And once again, that phrase is in every one of these admonitions. And what he's saying is, perk up your spiritual ears. Be sensitive to what the Word of God is teaching you. Obey it. Even like in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it's uh, what we call the great Shema. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And he talks about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. That word here, it gives the idea not just of being able to hear what is being said, but not only to hear it, but to do it. And so that's what he's saying here. Those who have spiritual ears to hear, in other words, you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then what you should do, he's saying is, what you should do is listen to the Word of God, listen to the Spirit of God, and do what it says. You ever get that in church? The pastor's talking about something. I used to call it white knuckling. Uh, I grew up in a church that had pews instead of chairs, and you could like put your hands on the pew in front of you. And when the preacher was saying something or giving an invitation and you knew, he's like, ooh, ooh, my toes. He stepped on my toes. I know I should respond. And you just kind of grab a hold of the bench and white knuckle it. You're holding on so tightly. He says, don't do that. But respond. Listen. He who has an ear to hear, let him listen to what the Spirit is saying to you. So what the Spirit of God is saying to you, especially today, I hope you will follow. I've got three points that I want to give you today that show us how to resist the enemy. How do we resist? This church was faced with a problem. They had the opportunity to resist that spirit of Jezebel. I'm going to explain what that is. Uh, The first point is this. You need to recognize the oppression. Not only recognize what it is, but recognize that you are going to be oppressed. The Apostle Paul said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against people, but rather against the enemy. It's against Satan, Lucifer, the demons, the powers of this world, whatever you want to call them, that is what we're wrestling against, okay? And let me explain to you what this meant whenever he was saying that Uh, you've got this woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess as she's being turned loose in the church. There are uh, three viewpoints on that from scholars, okay? And and all of them are legitimate, but I'm going to tell you which one I believe he's talking about. There are those that believe that there was actually a woman named Jezebel in the church. Let me tell you how unlikely that was. That was the first century, and most of these believers were Jewish people. Uh, This was in the early part of the church. Um, And with the history of Jezebel and the nation of Israel, that would have been as unlikely as a Holocaust survivor in our culture naming their son Adolf Hitler. That, That was the same thing. So I don't think that's very likely. There are those that believe that there was a group of people in the church that were kind of taking advantage and they were trying to spread this idea that what they did, particularly going to these trade guilds and and compromising financially and morally and all this stuff, they're like, you know what, it's okay in order for you to get ahead. It's not really that big of a deal. And there are those that believe that there were real people. 
Now, I believe what he's talking about here was the third thing. Now, I know he talked about repenting and giving her time to repent. And I believe he's talking about, in general, people, not just in this church, but people who allow the oppression of the spirit of Jezebel. You've probably heard about the spirit of Jezebel. Let me explain what that means. Now, there's some people that make that kind of spooky, but we actually have clear evidence from the Word of God about what the spirit of Jezebel actually is. Now, if you don't know who Jezebel was, she was the wife of King Ahab of Israel, okay? This was before they were ever taken into captivity. This is in the Old Testament period. And uh, she was uh, the daughter of a pagan king. She was not Jewish. And she became the queen of Israel And she promoted the worship of false gods, particularly Baal and Asherah. Now, these are uh, two gods that are fertility gods, and they're wrapped around uh, immorality, and they're wrapped around money. Isn't it interesting that that was the two things that that this church was dealing with, okay? So, she was a wicked, wicked woman. And in the Old Testament, and I don't have time to read the whole story, uh, but in the Old Testament, uh, there is a story in 1 Kings chapter 18 to 19, and you can read it if you'd like to. It's a very, very interesting story. But a prophet named Elijah, he was a man of God. And uh, he went to Abraham, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story because it would be too long. Uh, Ahab was a wicked king. His wife Jezebel was wicked. They were leading the Israelites into sexual immorality and into worship of false god, the worship of idols. And Elijah comes to the king and, and says, you know what? God is going to judge us. He's going to judge you for your wickedness. And it's not going to rain for three years. And that's what happened. And then the story goes uh, that after three years, God spoke to him. He goes out and he calls uh, for a sacrifice. And uh, the, all of the prophets of Baal and Asherah were there. And it was just him representing Jehovah God. And he's like, whoever's sacrifice calls down fire out of heaven, that's who we're going to worship. And of course, they tried all day. They cut themselves. They were bleeding. They were screaming. And Elijah started making fun of them. Actually, in the translation, if you don't know Hebrew, um, in, the, in the Hebrew, he kind of mocks them and says, if we put it in our modern language, uh, maybe he's going to the bathroom. The reason he's not answering you, maybe he's got to go to the bathroom. And uh, actually, it would be a little more crude than that, uh, but some of you are very sensitive, so I won't say what it actually means, okay? Uh, But then, of course, it failed, and then Elijah prayed, and fire came down from heaven and burned up the sacrifice. And eventually, what happened was Elijah killed all 850 of these false prophets. Incredible. And then it began to rain again, And then this is what happens. This is where Jezebel comes in. This man of God that had done a great work of God and defended what, and God doesn't need defending, but he defended God in front of all Israel. This queen said, you're going to be dead by tomorrow. I'm going to make sure of it. And this man who was so bold that he was willing to stand up against the king He was willing to kill 850 prophets. It almost indicates that it was almost by himself. I believe he did have others helping him. But this man of God, this bold man of God, all of a sudden, he went into a funk. And he ran for his life. And in fact, he goes and he begins to say some things that show us and indicate to us what the spirit of Jezebel is. Now, when I say you got to recognize the oppression, you got to recognize what is happening in your life. You got to recognize how the devil will try to discourage you. You got to recognize how he will attack you. Now, let me tell you, even if you're a believer, the devil can attack you. 
and he can try to trip you up. And he has no power over God. And when we surrender to the Lord, we can overcome him, but he's going to try. And I want to show you from this story of Elijah what actually the spirit of Jezebel is. Whenever uh, she began to oppress, and she was a wicked woman representing the devil, she was a wicked woman. Whenever she began to oppress this strong man of God, I want you to notice what happened to him. And the same thing can happen to you and me, and we've got to recognize it when it comes. The first thing that happened was, was fear. He ran for his life. Now, how could a man who just killed 850 false prophets be afraid of one woman? Do you know that often, and I'm not talking about the fear of like spiders or things of that nature, you know. If you don't like spiders, that doesn't mean the devil is attacking you, okay. Uh, it just means that, you know, you don't like spiders. I, I don't like spiders. Um, I would never have a pet tarantula. If anybody in here does, leave. All right, so that's all I'm saying. Uh, we, I don't get into that. If you do, that's fine. Uh, but we're not talking about that kind of fear. We're talking about an inordinate, unexplainable, overwhelming fear. Some of you have that fear from the future or of the future. What's it going to be like? Are we going to be okay? Will the economy crash? What's going to happen if I lose my job? And you operate in a constant spirit of fear, maybe about your marriage, maybe about your kids, maybe about your job, maybe about your health. But listen to me. And we're not talking about natural, normal things. We're talking about an inordinate, overwhelming, incapacitating fear. Let me tell you, you might want to recognize that as an attack from the enemy. Now, I'm not suggesting that every time you get afraid of anything, if you're afraid of thunderstorms, uh, that's not the devil attacking you, okay? But the truth is, often, there will be a spirit of fear, that's the spirit of Jezebel, that will come in your life, and if you're not careful, it will defeat you. Notice another thing that this man of God went through. Uh, the, the second thing of the spirit of Jezebel is lasting discouragement and depression. Now, let me just get this out of the way. I do believe that people have mental health problems, okay? That's a real thing. I'm not denying that. I do believe that doctor's care and medicine helps, okay? So if you are prescribed medication for this, I'm not suggesting that you're demon-possessed uh, because you take medication, okay? Uh, take your medication. Listen to me. Take your medication, all right? But we live in a culture that has more mental health issues than in the history of the world. There are more people under 25 years of age that attempt and think about suicide and live in a state of hopelessness than ever in the history of our country, ever. There are more people that struggle with mental health issues. Now, once again, I do believe that some things are just related to our body, our physiology and all this stuff. I get that. But I want you to hear me when I say this. If there is an overwhelming, unconquerable depression and discouragement that overcomes you, go to the doctor, seek medication. Please do that. But you also need to recognize that sometimes that comes because of the attack of the enemy, which would be called the spirit of Jezebel. You see, this man of God, he went from being bold. Can you imagine this? In a time, short time as a day, he went from being so bold to defy the king, to defy the queen, to kill 850 prophets of Baal. And then the very next day, he's running for his life. He's in a cave and he's just in a funk. He's in a state of depression. And he's like, oh, you know, he even went to the next level, which is suicidal thoughts. He said to God, I don't even want to live. And once again, I fully recognize issues of mental health. Please hear me. Do I need to repeat that? You understand what I'm saying? But if you're having suicidal thoughts, that may be an attack of the enemy. He's a liar. And he'll try to discourage you. He'll try to get you to think that you're not worth anything. But you are. According to the Word of God, 
According to Jesus, you are. But that may be the spirit of Jezebel. Then uh, Elijah had feelings of isolation or thinking that you're all alone. And maybe if you feel that way, that you're all alone, that you're the only one that's ever gone through this, that you're the only one that's suffering this, this feeling that nobody cares, that nobody loves you, that everybody's rejected you, that there's nobody to help you. That's what Elijah felt. You know what he said? I'm the only one, God. You ever felt that way? That's the spirit of Jezebel. And, and then he had a loss of desire for his purpose and for serving God. He's like, I quit. I don't want to do this anymore. And, and perhaps, maybe, sometimes it's just that we're tired and need a break. But maybe for many of us, and I've been to this spot in my life before, where you're just like, I just don't want to do this anymore. I mean, I know God has a purpose and I know God has a plan and I know that he's called me. I just don't feel like doing this anymore. I don't want to, I just don't want to go to the effort. I, I just feel like staying home. I just feel like that I need to do something else. You ever been there with serving God, with God's purpose in your life? That is a very recognizable, according to scripture, attack of the spirit of Jezebel. Now, I'm not suggesting that anybody that ever gets discouraged or ever gets tired uh, is demon-possessed. Please hear me. But you don't have to be demon-possessed like on the movies and your head spin around in order to be attacked by the enemy. According to the Word of God, the enemy will attack you. They, the, the devil himself attacked Jesus. And if he gets tempted, you and I will as well, okay? So uh, maybe this loss of desire, maybe you need to recognize this as an attack of the enemy. Or uh, he faced the temptation to compromise his beliefs and his convictions. And this is a big one. Because every one of us, if you're serving God, you're going to be tempted to compromise your beliefs and your convictions. Sometimes it comes through lustful temptation. You might, be conv- you might be tempted to cheat on your spouse. You might be tempted uh, sexually in some other area. You might be tempted with pornography. But there's this inordinate temptation that overwhelms you. And you feel like that you can't overcome it. And I've got good news for you. You can't overcome it through the power of Jesus Christ. Okay? And, um, but if you have this inordinate temptation to deny your convictions, to give in, to throw in the towel. You need to recognize that for what it is. And then the last thing is this. You know what Elijah faced? Extreme exhaustion. Now, I'm not suggesting that every time you get exhausted that that's an attack of the enemy. Sometimes it's because you worked really hard or you didn't sleep enough or you're not taking care of your health. Okay, I get that. But Elijah was at the point that he was so extremely exhausted that he couldn't even make wise decisions. And this is a man of God, by the way. Now, here's what the angel did for him. Read that uh, in Scripture there the, in 1 Kings 18 and 19. Um, you know what the angel did for him? It says he made a cake. He made a cake, and he said, eat this, Elijah, And then he told him to sleep, to take a nap. And Elijah did. When he woke up, he gave him some more cake and told him to take another nap. And so I'm telling you that the Word of God tells us cake and naps are good for you, okay? Sometimes it's the Word of God. Do not argue with it, okay? I mean, if you feel like eating some cake and taking a nap, that's a good thing. Just don't skip work, okay? And don't let your kids be late to school because you're doing that. But no, my point is this. Don't, you know, setting the humor aside, sometimes you need to recognize that you make yourself vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy because of your schedule. You ever said, I don't have time to do that. How many is guilty of that? I've said it. I don't have time to do that. Some of you are asleep. All right, so all of us have said that. Do you know that we all have, listen, 
the exact same amount of time every day. You got 24 hours. Now, the better way to say it is that I have chosen my schedule and my schedule won't allow me to do that. Well, that may be true. But we all have the exact same amount of time. Um, if you say, well, I don't have time to go to church or I don't have time to serve the Lord or I don't have time to spend with my kids. Well, that's not true. You just choose to do something else. And my point is this. Sometimes we got to change our schedule in order to overcome the attacks of the enemy. Are, are you listening? Is this helpful? Is this real? Okay. Look, the fact is, some of us, we don't recognize the real problem in our life. And the real problem is sometimes we just do too much and we don't get enough rest. And, and we, and please forgive me, I don't want to offend anybody. You say, well, I didn't go to church to be offended. Where do you normally go? All right, this is as good a place as any to be offended, right? Okay, so uh, just buckle your belt, all right? Maybe you're spending too much time on Facebook. Oh, please don't throw anything at me. Maybe you're spending too much time on social media. And I'm not against watching anything on Netflix, okay? But maybe, maybe eight hours on Netflix is a bit too much, is all I'm saying, all right? You don't need to binge watch everything that comes out. Now, and I know this is probably making some of you uncomfortable, but I want you to recognize the attacks of the enemy. Sometimes they're subtle. And sometimes you've got to recognize that you've got to change your schedule to avoid exhaustion. All right, that's point number one. Now, the rest of it's not going to be this long, okay? So don't, don't worry. Point number two is this. You got to resist the enemy. You got to recognize the oppression, recognize the attacks, recognize what they are. And then, number two, you got to resist. He said, Hold fast to what you have until I come. You know what he's saying there? Hold on. Stand strong. Don't give up. That's pretty good practical advice, isn't it? Sometimes you feel like you're at the end of your rope and your fingers are slipping. Well, tie a knot in it and hold on, all right? That's what he's saying. Resist the enemy. Sometimes we don't think we can, but let me show you how. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Hello. You want him to leave you alone? Resist him. Humble yourself before God. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let me just explain what he's saying there. You want to resist the enemy. And I know you do. Well, he says, first of all, you got to humble yourselves. It's through humility. It's not through pride. If you think you can do this on your own without God's help, you're wrong. You're wrong. I've made the statement before. I will never, ever cheat on my wife. I uh, made that commitment. I never have, and I never will. Only by the grace of God. I realize I'm human just like everybody else, and the only way that I can have confidence that I'm not ever going to do that, you know how it is? I am resisting the enemy. I'm humbling myself and realizing that I can't do this by myself. I never say, I never say that I can do this on my own. But with God's help, I guarantee I can do it. And so can you. And so he says, be humble. He says, surrender to God. He says, depend on him. And then the word repent, in other words, he said, purify your hearts, you sinners. In other words, he says, change your mind. Agree with God. That's all repentance is. It's a beautiful word. We think it's a nasty word, but it's a beautiful word. It's not a harsh word. It is a helpful word. Change your mind. The Bible tells us that uh, if we don't, watch out and receive God's help that we're just going to do everything that the world does. And we're not going to take access or, or, or take advantage of the power that God has given us. He says, be single-minded. In other words, don't keep your mind in three or four places. You got to focus. You, you, you want to resist the enemy. You want to avoid the attacks of Jezebel. You want to do that you got to learn how to be single-minded. I heard a guy tell me this one time about a decision I made. 
He said, make the decision and spend the rest of your life making it the right one. Now, I realize that we all make wrong decisions from time to time. And he's not talking about that. But he's talking about being single-minded. You know, to be single-minded, you got to make a determination and go for it. When you want to be closer to God, when you want God's blessings in your life, when you want to live out of the overflow, not the undertow, you got to make a single-minded decision that no matter what, no matter come hell or high water, you're going to be in church. You're going to serve God. And you're going to be connected that way. You know what that does? It makes you single-minded. It makes you single-minded. And God says, you want to resist the enemy? Do that. Then here's the final thought. Remember the reward. Sometimes we forget the blessing. You know, and I'm guilty of that. Are you this kind of person? I tend to be this way. I have a goal. I'm fighting. I'm working. I'm hard getting there, you know, and I'm finally I get there. And I don't really take a lot of time to celebrate. I look at the next thing. Let's move on to that. I think we need to pause And whatever cliche you want to use, stop and smell the roses, stop and smell the coffee, or better yet, stop and drink the coffee. All right, that's a better one. Um, No matter what it is, we've got to learn to rejoice in the reward. Rejoice in what God has done in your life. I realize the last couple years have been tough on a lot of people. But you know what? And we have prayer every Monday morning at our office at 6.30. For any of you that would like to come, I invite you to come out. You don't have to stay the entire time, but it's a great way to start your week. Uh, but one of our elders, Will, he, he uh, you know, say, how are you doing this morning, Will? And he's like, I'm alive. And you know what we need to do? We need to stop and rejoice. I know that some things are tough, but you know what? You're still above the ground. You ain't six feet under. Your life, you still draw in breath in your lungs. Praise God. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Praise God. And, and no matter what challenges you face, there are a lot of them, okay? We all have challenges. But you're still here. You're still kicking. You're still going. You're still thriving. You're still surviving. Stop and thank God. You may have kids that are not doing exactly what you like, and especially as they get adults, they will not, I promise you. But thank God that he blessed you. Even if you've got struggles right now, thank God for those good times. Thank God for those wonderful memories. We need to rejoice in the reward. Remember the reward. But notice what Jesus said. And the implication that Jesus is giving here is not that you endure to the end, but I have endured. And, and the point is not to trust your strength but to trust in the strength of Jesus because he is the one that has overcome. Not you, but he did. He died on the cross. He was buried. And thank God he got up out of the grave and he's alive today. He's the one that has conquered for you and me. And he says to the one who conquers, I'm going to give authority. I'm going to give you authority. I, and he's talking about in eternity in the passage there, but I believe he gives us authority in life. The authority. You know what a person that has authority does? They're able to affect their environment. They're able to affect outcomes. If I have the authority, and let me just give you an example. Uh, If you've ever been pulled over by the police because you were speeding, um, that person has authority. It's not that they themselves are authoritarian. They have the authority of the laws of the land behind them, and they have that authority to tell me, slow down, slow down. They have the authority to give me a ticket. Do you know that God says you have authority in life when you trust him and you resist the enemy? You have the authority to say no to sin. You have the authority to overcome. You have the authority to persevere. You have the authority to say to the spirit of Jezebel in your life, I will not be influenced by you. I will not quit. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go on in the name of Jesus. You have that authority. And then notice, and I used to not understand this. He talked about the rod of iron. The rod of iron. (laughs) I used to think that meant that Jesus is walking around this 
big old rod, metal and uh, object, you know, and hitting people in the head and, you know, just being mean. And, but that's not what that means at all. This refers back to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know that, all right? And he, it says in Psalm 23, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, I got to be honest. I grew up in a church and I heard a preacher preach this one time that the rod and the staff, and he gave an illustration about how a shepherd, if a sheep wandered off, would break its leg with the rod and bring it back on his shoulder so it wouldn't wander away anymore. And his point was that God's looking to beat you up any chance he gets. That was kind of the point. And I was like, ooh, that doesn't sound very comforting. Um, but that's not what the rod and the staff were for. They were not for the sheep. They were for the enemy. They were for the wolves and the bears. And when Jesus says he's going to give you this rod of iron, you'll be able to rule. The comfort is that God will defeat the enemy in your life. And you can take comfort in that. You don't have to give in to the spirit of Jezebel. You don't have to give in to this idea that I'm going to quit. Just like Elijah. And every one of us face it in life. But he says, take comfort and know that I have a rod. And it's not just any rod. It is a rod of iron. But it isn't for you, my love. It's for the enemy. Thank God that in Jesus Christ, we can overcome. Even the spirit of Jezebel that may be bothering you, you can overcome it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, church. Thank God for those promises. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the love that we see, the grace that we see, even in the book of Revelation. Lord, help us to please you, just like you bragged on this church of what they were doing. Help us to correct some things in our life. Help us to repent, to receive your grace. And help us to remember the reward. I pray for people in this church that may be facing the spirit of Jezebel that tries to intimidate them through fear or discouragement or depression or suicidal thoughts or loss of desire to do your will, loss of desire to live for their purpose in life. Lord, whatever it is that they face, help each of us to recognize that for what it is and to resist the devil by humbling ourselves and coming to you because you have the authority in our life. And Lord, we want to thank you that you love us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.